Despite some very public mistakes and flubs, there are still many companies working on developing augmented reality and virtual reality technologies to advance the concept of spatial computing. Apple's recent announcement of its Vision Pro headset, along with new hardware from Meta, show that there is still a lot of money and interest in this space. On this episode of Today in Tech, we're going to talk about whether this will kickstart the technology into a generational shift that changes the way we work, communicate, and relax in the future. Hi, everyone. I'm Keith Shaw. Welcome to Today in Tech. Joining me on the show today is Zach Duff. He is the co-founder and CEO of Jigspace, as well as an industry leader in the world of AR and VR. Welcome to the show. You're coming to us from Australia, so uh, thanks for getting up early to talk to us today. Yeah, no worries, Keith. Thanks for having me on. All right. So, uh, you know, we were talking uh, earlier about that you believe that we're facing a generational shift through this concept of spatial computing um, that are, that is going to change everything moving forward. What are some of these core elements that you've identified in the space, having worked in the industry for so long? Yeah, I think uh, I think there's 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 a few things that are connected that we've kind of seen seen shifting over probably the last 20, 30 years that are starting to become more, uh, they're becoming more and more obvious and kind of um, prevalent as uh, as we go along further. The first one was uh, that there's, there's CAD files for everything. Like 3D is, is everywhere. We're already kind of working in that, uh, in that format. It's, I think it was actually the late fifties when CAD started, like was invented, but it really took off in kind of the eighties late eighties, but the, after that, you've got video games and 3d technology. So people have been playing games and consuming media in that since the, since the early nineties, really. And now you've got a generation of kids on, on the back of that who are playing Fortnite, Roblox, Minecraft. They're, they're just, they're part of a generation that kind of, they have their social interactions in 3d. So it's become this, a, a very expected common way of, of interacting and, and kind of uh, existing and socializing. And then the the next, the, the third piece is that at any, any of the computing, like the paradigm shifts that have happened, the way that we work has been heavily influenced by the way that we play. Mm-hmm. And by the interfaces that bring, uh, yeah, that bring entertainment really. So if you look at, or if you look at what happened with the iPhone apps that came out in 2000 and uh, like when the app store launched in 2008, nine, whatever yeah, it was, yeah, yeah. you got that, you got these, these experiences that were super polished, these apps, and that changed everyone's expectation about how their work tools should feel about how how they should use their their tools at work. They didn't want to just use SAP software like for the rest of their lives. They wanted Monday.com, something that looked really nice. So that expectation, we're starting to see that shift as well with a generation that exists in 3D, plays their games in 3D. Mm -hmm. A lot of their experiences are there. Now they're kind of, why can't we have, we've got all these CAD files. Yeah. We've been using all this technology. Why can't we have this? Why can't we have this in, in our regular lives? And I think that's like the underpinnings of this. Then you obviously have the hardware and tech, hardware and software converging to a point. Yeah. Like Vision Pro. So that's, I think we're just, all of these things have created this perfect cauldron of, uh, of opportunity for a new paradigm. Yeah. And, and I think we were also talking about this concept of embodied cognition. Can you go over mm. that, what, what, what that concept is? And, and that's one of the things that will also drive this movement, right? Yeah, that's a, that's a, like a body of research that's been growing since the nineties. And I think intuitively everyone understands this, but it is uh, the kind of the, the research has been going into it like why is it really a fundamentally human thing but it is the idea that we don't just learn by using our minds to mm-hmm. consume information but we actually learn with our entire body and all of our experience so it's our it's the full central experience we have learning about things that's what actually um like fundamentally drives cognition that's a so, for example, my two-year-old daughter, 
I can talk to her about a toy car. I can show her pictures. I can make sounds. I can do all of the stuff except actually give her that toy. Mm -hmm. But until she sees that, until she actually plays with it, she's not going to know what it is like in, in its fullness. And that's the underpinnings of spatial computing is that, that we can, we experience the world in three dimensions. Our minds actually create a three dimensional model of the space that we're in when we're trying to set up our care furniture. It's the, I think the classic example of <laughs> anti embodied cognition, even though they're the very best in the world at their instructions, it's still something that people struggle with because you're abstracting what is fundamentally a three dimensional problem that our mind has to interact with. You're abstracting it down to two dimensions and cutting out all of that a whole dimension of information. So it's 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 a really, really powerful thing for us to now be understanding that. And I think it it excites me. It excites me because we're it's not I mean we're ironically we are adding a, a layer of tech even even closer to our faces, but it is actually removing a layer of abstraction from the world. That is, to me, a a really powerful thing. The technology should become transparent in the end because we're just trying to get back to exactly how we experience the world, we understand the world, we inter interact with it. That's exciting. Uh, okay, and so let's go back a little bit to, you know, jump back for either last six months, last year or so, even before then. What went wrong with some of these early attempts at either AR and VR um, I mean, you could go back all the way to the '90s to really talk about some of those the early VR attempt attempts, with, whether in mm -hmm. gaming or some other areas. Like, and and then this whole metaverse concept that was that was the the big new thing probably one to two years ago before all this AI stuff took off. Um, like, mm -hmm. from your perspective, what what went wrong, or did or did it go wrong? I mean, you could all, always say that it never really yeah. went wrong. It just it just went away for a while, or the spotlight went off. <laughs> I think, I think it's like a, a hype cycles. They automatically they kind of get away from themselves uh, at any yeah at some point. Like it, I think everyone expects that that bubble will burst at some point. Mm -hmm. it hasn't happened to AI yet. Um, maybe it's manipulating us. <laughs> no, but the, uh, the the I think. The metaverse, like the 90s VR, I think it was very, like it was very exciting. And I think there was a, there was a lot happening in 3D as well in computer generated for film. And it, it, it was a very interesting, exciting time for that technology. But it was so fresh. I didn't, like I missed all of that from where I grew up. There yeah. was definitely not any VR, but the, the, what we've seen with this last one, what I think has happened is when it gets, what hype invariably does is it starts to step further and further away from what people actually do and actually would use it for. It, it stops being about utility in their life somewhere that they could see it being applicable and you end up trying to convince people of things. You, you're trying to convince them that it is super important to them. This is going to be the best thing, but it actually feels like, it's not particularly something they enjoy doing right now. Like no one really wanted to spend all of their time in a 3D world just hanging out and waving. And <laughs> like like if, if anything, the pandemic showed us that people were pretty eager to get back to seeing people in real life. I think there's a, it's a little bit of the emperor has no clothes kind of moment where you go, wait a second, is this what I actually want and need? And I think there was generally a little bit of scepticism about that. And I think it's good that it ended. I think it's good that that bubble ended. I actually think it was good that it happened as well because it kind of lifts, it's a, it's a rising tide. So it certainly did educate a lot of people about what was possible, about the future of the technology, all that stuff. Meta certainly have plowed ahead with the hardware and the technology side of it, which has been fantastic for everyone. Yeah. But I think uh, I think it just started to get it started to get too abstract and too far away from what people actually wanted to do. Um and what they needed to do, because ultimately you don't want to move that far from where you're actually you're already at. Yeah. No one really wants to shift that much. 
So, so what are you seeing in in the space that will become a common element and a common vision for spatial computing? Like, is there anything that's going to get an, a mainstream audience to go, ah, oh, now I get it. Now I get it. Now I can see this happening. Will it be in one of these particular areas like gaming or will it be something else that, that gets people to start understanding where the future is, is at it? I sometimes wonder whether it's going to be just a a slow burn and we don't realise that it's happened. Okay. I, I was thinking about this just, I was talking about this to someone the other day. I remember there was a moment when I realised that I was checking my phone every night in bed before I went to sleep and picking it up the first thing in the morning. Mm-hmm that that was my routine. That was a, that was like a real moment where I was, oh, wow, this technology is something that I've just, it's just become second nature to me. And I wonder if we're going to see the same thing, because if you, if again, you look back at, at the iPhone, there, you could have kind of peered through, peered through the, the fogs of, fog of time a little bit and, worked out what would have been important, we'd use it for email a lot and that social media could have been a thing, but it was it was really once we're in it and you're like in 2011, 12, where it's just kind of, it's everywhere and it seems to be there's apps for everything and it really changed it. I don't know if you could kind of pinpoint one moment where everyone was like, oh, whoa, we absolutely get it. I think it's just kind of like a boiling boiling water frog moment <laughs> well, <laughs> but i think i think i think there is going to be i think it will actually start like there's two places that it's always started with technology there's utility and it's typically kind of oh i've got uh it's oh, giving me a thumbs up did someone, you say that no someone give you a thumbs up that's really cool <laughs> uh, uh, uh it's it gives there's, there's the two areas are uh, there's utility which is kind of boring utility at, at first and then there's entertainment those are the two areas that that really have have kind of driven most technology when the first uh, the first big computing mainframes were, were started being a thing in the 50s and 60s there was games there was space war mm-hmm, mm-hmm. like that's that's kind of those two things have been very much in parallel so i think we're already seeing that entertainment is happening and i think it is for everyone who is kind of down on virtual reality as a as a format it is certainly like it is it's like console level sales but it is like a a solid console like i think it's it's got more more units for the quest 2 than the xbox in market the newest xbox so that's like that's a big that's a big thing and it's it's huge in like outside of the west if you go into asia southeast asia vr is massive there so it is certainly having a big impact and gaming is a huge component of that so we're seeing that happen i think you'll also get in industries that are not particularly like exciting in the main they're going to start using that technology a, a lot more and i think they're already doing that it's just not it's not in the general consciousness as much as it will be i reckon the moment the moment we get ikea furniture with ar instructions is kind of like that it, it'll be there when that happens yeah i mean that was the, one of the first things i thought of is you get the the instruction manual uh, for anything that you're building not not necessarily just ikea um and you go how did they draw this i can't see this in 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 my physical location but if i could slap on some goggles and then and then an animation runs me through it with an overlay of Mm -hmm. my actual equipment a it could tell me if the pieces are right if i'm actually connecting the right pieces Um, but then second would be this is how it should look and this is how you should connect it i mean that just seems like that's a huge um a huge bonus this becoming the the quote and, I, and i'm going to use your quote this is from your pre-call the quote really boring business applications can, <laughs> can, and because it, it, it does seem like the, you know gaming is doing its own cool thing with vr but that might not convince enough people to to adopt the technology mm. similar to pcs and even phones it was that really boring business application that they said and 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 saw what said wow okay now i can understand this and use it what are you seeing in some of those really boring business applications that that 
make spatial computing a, a bonus? I think it, it comes back to that embodied cognition, like to that concept and the impact that that has. And there is a, like a fantastically measurable impact you can have when you, you when you're comparing, trying to understand things just through text or images or paper, like flat. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, two dimensional ways. And then when you actually in three dimensions are able to communicate or like knowledge transfer is the, the term for it, but you're actually able to really get someone to understand something quickly. Where in particular I'm seeing it really effective is when it's a, when you need to explain something to someone that is typically complex that is already a process that has quite a few steps to go through when you need them to understand that, Uh, like selling products that are big, complex, technical, expensive, that process for, let's say, robotics or lab automation, that kind of thing, which is like even for people that are in the space, is still there's a lot of complexity in that. Communicating the value of the product or differentiation, those kind of things is a long process that you can shorten dramatically by bringing spatial computing into the mix because you actually, you can communicate it in a way that people immediately understand. If they're, if you're doing a lab fit out for a, uh, for a, a medical lab and you're automating this process, you don't have to go in there and like take photos, do a Photoshop, get floor plans, do mock-ups of it, go back through the engineering department, et cetera, et cetera. You can actually send them what it would look like. They can place it down in their lab, look at it and go, right, okay, that makes sense. This is this is how it would be. We understand all of these changes, et cetera. And that that time is shortened dramatically. So I think there's things like that where it's about a high value transaction that requires complex knowledge transfer. That was uh <laughs> it was a mouthful that line, but that's really that's that's what <laughs> that's where I think you'll get value from it. And that's while it's not the most exciting thing in the world, it certainly is. We, and we're, you're looking at like seventy five percent reduction in the time it takes to explain something. And if that is something that is complex, expensive, technical, that is a massive. And there's, sorry, there's a uh, feather floating <laughs> in my vision, but the uh, that is a massive that is a massive change, a massive impact on a business. So right. I think we'll see it there and those kind of places early on. But as we go, it'll become much more consumerized, and you get that same value, but in consumer cases. Do you think there's a case where uh, the industry is doing a good enough job explaining that the hardware you need would be something that enhances an existing process or an existing uh, thing that you're doing, such as entertainment, rather than replacing it? And maybe the consumers think that this will replace me you, me sitting in a computer or me using my phone, and that's not really what it's going to be used for. Do you, you know, is, is there a disconnect there between what the industry is advertising versus what consumers are expecting? I think it's really hard to explain how a piece of technology is going to change your life. Something that is as fundamental as as a new computing device. Like I think it, I think it is really hard to explain that clearly because there are certain things that you can only fully grasp, especially with spatial, when you yeah. actually experience it when you go through that process. So I think you're going to get, and you do see it a lot, you get the basics of like, you'll watch movies, you'll play games, you'll talk to your friends. It's like, yep. And it, okay. Yeah. And like, and isn't that the problem it's, that it's, Apple's it's, having? Yeah. Isn't that, isn't that one of their, the issues they, they can show you all the videos of what it might look like, but until you put on the headset, then you might get it once you put that headset on. And it seems like that's the one of the big hurdles in addition to the cost that, that Apple's going to have. I mean, I keep yeah, thinking back to the, to the app store yeah. and the impact that that had for the iOS platform, like it just unleashing the, like the massive developer pool and lowering the barriers to entry to that platform to what was it ninety nine dollars a year for a developer license mm-hmm. that that's what really drove that's what drove the massive massive uh, expansion of that platform that's what I think drove it so I think we're gonna 
I think we're really going to see that too. Is that you can't you can't like it's really hard to predict what a what the killer app is going to be for it when you know that the the variable piece is two hundred million apps down the line. Like that's it, there's there's so much to come out of that. So I think the the challenge will be how do how do those stories get elevated and how do we how do we get that in as in front of as many people as possible is what I think is going to be the the most interesting piece is all the ways that it is used by developers to make interesting things. Yeah. It's uh yeah. I think that's the most powerful piece. Is it is it gonna be Apple that ends up doing that or can other companies like Meta, can they can they do the same thing when, when and open up their app store so much that developers create a bunch of apps for their hardware as well? Is because it, it does feel like it's going to be a, a a two company game at some point, uh, maybe a third, maybe Google will get it back in, into the space. Yeah, I feel like uh, Samsung is certainly okay. Always, yeah, that's a good point uh, too. Yeah, they, they've got a lot of heft. They can they can kind of weigh it into a market pretty well. I think there's, uh, I think you kind of have to, uh, you have to at some point. Like, I think that's expected from everyone is that they're able to, they can get their apps, they can get their their experience on the platform. I think as, as soon as you go really closed, you're, yeah, you're yeah. kind of, uh, <laughs> you're limiting yourself massively. I think that ends up, you end up having to go really, really high end, really, really focused, niche, niche driven. I can't see any of those big players wanting that. Or being able to to kind of justify that, yeah, and 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 I think there's another element that that we might not be realizing yet, and that's the um, mm. potential of, of of spatial computing allowing for creators, similar to the way that that the smartphones allowed creators to start creating content and uploading that to the you know social media and things like that. I could see similar uh, thing with with these. Um, AR VR headsets and spatial computing devices. The most exciting thing I saw from that Vision Pro announcement was the spatial camera on the system. Mm -hmm. And now they put a spatial camera on the new iPhone 15 where you could then walk around and take pictures and videos of your space. But I'm thinking of it even from a from a bigger perspective. Like if you and I, you know, played, uh, th you know, 3D shooter games all the time um, and I'd be like, well, I don't feel like going into a, a, a toolbox and creating uh, a map for you. What if I just filmed myself walking around the office in the studio space here, um, captured it with my camera and then that creates a map and then you do the same thing at your office or your house mm. and then all of a sudden we now have two maps um and you would you know i would have an advantage because i would know where i could hide here <laughs> um, but then you could do the same thing in, in your map like that mm. that idea or or even like a driving game where you're driving around your familiar environments rather than just random cities mm. that sometimes work sometimes don't like doesn't that feel like that could produce the need for for more people to get into it yeah, that's uh, that was the the most exciting thing for me with the the new iPhone announced was that the spatial yeah. spatial video. How cool did that look? Like that was, yeah. I, like I think having a two year old, I'm filming everything. Yeah, because you just want to have as much video content as possible. Well, I'm going to film everything with that now. Like. That's that's a massive, massive reason to have that device, and this technology just had a huge content boost. So yeah, that's that's really really cool. I haven't heard that idea about like scanning your environment and playing games together like that as maps. That's actually really that's really compelling. Yeah, I think the, that's really compelling. I don't know if if the the cameras can actually do that, but I know that similar companies like robotics companies that utilize lidar. Mm -hmm. um, can map can map a room usually having the robot scan around a room um, and then they create a 3d image of that you know f of that data yeah, using, I think using the lasers you can do that they, they've uh, well, they had lidar in the iPhone since 2020 I think yeah. it was the iPhone 12 that's you can do that right now you can scan you can walk around scan a room there's some awesome apps in the space like Luma um, <laughs> polycam that will do all that. 
Maybe I need yeah. to. Maybe I need to do that. Maybe then the spatial camera will yeah. then add something that that maybe these lidar cameras aren't doing. Um, I, I guess I need to mm. go to the app store and find all these these cool apps. Um, maybe you're sitting on a billion dollar idea here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. No. I, I'd rather just stick to being a podcast host <laughs> and talking to people about that. Um, what What are some of what are in in the gaming space? What are you are you seeing some really good uses of of the technology? as it's as it's developed like what's what's really cool in the gaming space yeah this is a place that's very close to my heart my background is all video games and arcade games and yeah it's uh yeah i care a lot about this space but the one that i uh, one game that i've spruced to everyone and kind of like if i've ever had a Quest to around kind of forced onto their head and got them to play it is Gorilla Tag. Unbelievably good game where you just play a gorilla and kind of run around and jump <laughs> off things. And it's, it's incredibly simple. And it was made by like one guy made this game and it just took off. Mm-hmm. Like it, it became like a viral hit. And I think there, there was an article in Road to VR about him crashing his servers the really early on. There was like 750,000 players early on that were just like spamming, spamming the platform, which was awesome. And there's so much simple joy in that game of running around and everyone engages in it and kind of buys into the, to the conceit of being a monkey. And it's, <laughs> it, it's really, really, <laughs> it's really, really fun. Like it's just fun and it's, it's an interaction that you don't, like fitness games, Beat Saber, all those ones, they're, they're good. They're good. And they, they kind of, they get you to swing around and do this stuff that is fun fitness. But Gorilla Tag doesn't, doesn't have that as a, a selling like a core value prop. It's not like, and you'll get fit while you're doing it. Like no one cares about that, but it is such a physical experience. Right. You come out of it feeling like just feeling like you can move differently around a space. You probably shouldn't try some of the maneuvers <laughs> that you learn in that game, but it is like that to me is really exciting. And then I played like racing games, Daytona arcade game was like the first game as a kid that really changed my life. And like racing sims and dirt rally two, right, right, in VR is spectacular. So it, it, we didn't really touch on the hardware part of it. Does does the hardware need to get? Less expensive, um, better, faster, lighter, probably all of the above. Um, what's your estimation of the current hardware situation? This would be obviously the Apple Vision Pro, which isn't even out to market yet, but you know they've had the announcement and they're saying next year. Um, I believe Meta has the Quest 3 coming out at some point. Um, have you been able to, mm-hmm. to, to, to learn what's, what's in that? You know, and, and is it, is, are we on a path towards better hardware at some point? I have no idea what anyone's plans are, but yeah. I, I think we're just naturally walking down that path. If you just look at the history of tech, it's kind of, it's going to get smaller, faster, more powerful, more accessible. I think that's just, that's a given, but it's, I think as it becomes more accessible, that's when we start to see uh, ubiquity is going to be massive like massive for this as soon as you have we're having a conversation you don't have to bring up oh hey do you have an ar device like <laughs> have you got your spatial computing device like that's as soon as we get to that point it'll be like you'll be able to see these these new completely new experiences come out completely new ways of interacting with information and the world and people that's when i think it, it really starts to change when I don't have to tell my mom about what an app store is. <laughs> right, right. What what time frame are you are you are you envisioning for a lot of this shift to happen? And and again, like with the whole frog in the boiling water, will we even notice that that the shift has occurred? Um, it's not going to be a giant spike of oh, this is when it happened. It, it, it's probably going to be eventual, but um, you got an estimate. You know, is this 10, 15, 20 years down the line? Is it is it less than that? <laughs> Peer into my crystal ball yeah. and make a fool of myself. <laughs> Why not? Because uh, don't worry about it. Because you know we're not yeah. going to come back and ever look at this prediction again. No. <laughs> yeah. No. I, I think uh, it was something. Yeah. That I was asked this in 2016 as well. Like how 
how far off do you think like a, a real like breakthrough piece of hardware will be a breakthrough device and i got the feeling the question was kind of a test and i'm uh, i guess i have to be optimistic in my job and i you have to you have to kind of believe that things are going to change and invest a certain amount in that belief but there's a large part of me that's quite skeptical and mm-hmm. pessimistic about all of these cycles and I expect to take longer than possible. So I said it was going to be eight to 12 years back then. Mm-hmm. And I think we're what, eight years down the track. Um, and it was, well, yeah, nine years when it was the Vision Pro was announced. So it kind of, that timeline feels about right. Um, I still think we're, to get to a point where it's your glasses, as 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 a device, I think there's a lot of technology to be invented to get to that point. So, yeah. So I, I'm going to put you on the spot. Hard, hard to know. Let's let's say yeah. the next the next thirty years are going to be crazy <laughs> because you look at, well, I mean, thirty years of personal computers. It, I remember playing with old ATs and XTs and four eight sixes as a kid, and look where it's come to now. And that was like the bee's knees. That was that was it. That was a the pinnacle, but like we've come so far with miniaturization. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was excited about pitfall in, in, you know, the early (laughs) early eighties. So I'm, I'm enthusiastic on whatever comes out. Um, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. Having been in the, the AR and VR space, do you have a favorite movie or a TV show that, that exemplifies what it could be or what it will be or does Hollywood generally get it wrong or you know does the industry rely on Hollywood to express a vision of what could be mm, that's a really good question um, I guess there have been some some movies that uh, were like for me very much has, has yeah I guess inspired me in mm-hmm. this direction. Probably not as explicitly, but Blade Runner definitely. Okay, there's something about that that kind of that kind of future vision that feels lived in, obviously dystopian, but there's something about that that is is very much a kind of I think informs quite a bit. Uh, the new one as well had the cool little projected um, character that was walking around a room that was very much like, yeah, it was a, it was a different way rather than being a device that was projecting onto the world or yeah. projecting something into the world. But that was, I thought that was really cool. Um, I know, I, I think in pop culture, Ready Player One yeah. as a book was like the most recent, like the, the book especially was like, yep. it was actually, it was a lot of fun. It was, a, it was a lot of fun as a book. And I think that movie for me is a little bit of, uh, I enjoy it. It's kind of, it's, it's silly and fun. Yeah, that that's, I was going to bring that up. It, it feels like most depictions of uh, a VR world or a metaverse can come from the written word and mm-hmm. written sci-fi. So Neil Stevenson and Snow Crash. Uh, mm-hmm. Tad Williams wrote a, bu- a book series called Other Other World, Other Land, something like that. Mm-hmm. It was a, and that was the same kind of idea that you would be sitting in a in a virtual reality tub at some point, um, mm-hmm. and, and be able to do everything where you know that you couldn't do in the real world. And um, they all had different kind of worlds. Ready Player One was like that, but but moving from the book mm-hmm. to the move, you know, TV and movies hasn't done as well, which is why you never really saw a, a, a filmed version of Snow Crash or some of these other mm. some of these other cyberpunk type of of, of experiences. Um, maybe we need yeah. something like that to 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 get our vision juices flowing. Yeah, I think I mean the Matrix was uh, yeah. a pretty. <laughs> Pretty big one, but also. But there were so many other elements in the Matrix. Yeah, yeah, I mean, the Matrix <laughs> was never really about the VR world, though, was it? Other than the All fact the tech, that, yeah, 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 other than that, you jacked in with the back of, in the back of your neck and and um, now experience the real world, which you thought was the real world, and it wasn't. Um, that's a, a you know, I I might have some sci-fi authors on the show to see see what they think about this. Um, I think actually the the a book that I haven't seen talked about so much that had a big impact on me was Rainbow's End by Verna Vinge. That was okay. like a 
a fantastic book about augmented reality and about how people would have a device that they could kind of like you could go to a, a theme park or a play area that allowed you to see all these different characters you can unlock certain levels of it it felt like that was a much more believable version of what regular life would feel like with spatial computing especially augmented reality the world we're in having extra stuff in it yeah that was a a really really good book and it was a lot of fun like i've reread it a couple of times it kind of i read it around the same time as ready player one but i think it also ready player one was very much like there was a, a bunch of like uh fan service and kind of yeah, tips of the hat to a lot of different things yeah so this this one had less of that and it was much more yeah, just a, a kind of classic romp. Yeah, there was more. Yeah, there was more uh, s- nostalgia in uh, Ready Player yeah. One, especially if you grew up with a lot of that stuff in the eighties and nineties. I don't even know if they got to the nineties, seventies and eighties at least. Mm. Uh, all right, uh, Zach. Anything else that you you want to kind of bring up? Did we cover everything that we that we needed to do? Yeah, I think I think so. I think I, it's like. It's such an exciting time. Yeah. It's such an exciting time right now as like, it's kind of your, as a, as a technologist at heart, the, I think that tech has the potential to change the way we do things, but open access to more and more people uh, to do more and more things. I think it's, it's so exciting to be at the start of a wave of yeah. that and to be able to kind of own that. I think I, I miss the mobile gaming wave by a bit like just missed that so i wasn't really kind of writing that as that came up and this is like a really exciting opportunity to do that but i think it's also potentially one of the the last computing platforms that we'll have that is uh, i mean it's we're essentially just going back to reality and then overlaying this digital layer on top of which is what we've been chasing with computers since they were first being developed is how do we take a digital version that we that we know exists and how can we overlay that over the world that's essentially it but we've been doing it through a little portal or yeah. through a screen or some way so we're kind of at this point now that's it's thrilling and all the things that we can do i find that i have a lot of fun just noodling on things that have nothing to do with my work or the startup that i run or any of that stuff like just make a little project here and there that kind of explores something fun i think we're in a like a magical time for technology all right. So what would you say to if there was a skeptic out there that, you know, has been beaten down by the world and is just a negative person and goes, ah, oh, this will never work. And I've seen it happen before. Like if you had like a Scrooge or, or, or a, uh, Oscar the Grouch type, um, how do you mm. convince them? I mean, you might not be able to completely convince them, but how do you get them at least to, to be open to this idea? I think it all comes down to experiencing it uh, I think that's it has to be that it, like uh, we, we even have this like the same thing that we have every time we're showing off what we do you can explain it as much as you like you can talk about the value proposition you can do all of that but until someone sees something in front of them that explains to them this complex thing when the moment they see it they go oh okay all of that makes sense yep. and now I get it and that I think that moment, that experience of getting it, the uh, the skeptics who sit back and get kind of frustrated by it and have been burnt by it, all that stuff. Like I, I get that. I get that. I'm like I think a a closeted hater as well. <laughs> but I, I get that you got to try it. You've got to you've yeah. got to actually get yourself out there and try it and kind of get out of your comfort zone. I think when they do that, when people do that, they see it, and if they find the piece that matters for them, my my mum is a she's an incredible artist like she's got an art academy not too far from where i am now she's like celebrated artist but for her that kind of tech is like she's not going to play beat saber she's not going to do a lot of things on those platforms but i showed her vermilion which is this vr painting app yep and she just like that for her that was so so big she wanted to stream art classes from vr and start building building her more of a, like more channels for herself with that like that's a that kind of thing i think is the power of it that there's a painting out that can speak to a a fine artist who has nothing to do with that kind of tech i think that's i think that's it you just gotta you gotta hold them down and strap the device on their head and 
<laughs> yeah, we just we just have, have to we, we just have to use the phrase just put the headset on, Grandpa. <laughs> just, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, all right, um, Zach. Uh, again, thanks for uh, for joining us on the show today. And I and from from one parent to another, take as many photos and videos of your your child at that age because you, mm. you'll never get it back. And and we took a lot of videos mm. and photos of our kids. Um, and I wish I had taken a lot more just because they they were mm. they were just so awesome at that age. I mean, they're good now, but they're teenagers, so they don't talk to me as much. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all right i'm gonna let you go back yeah. to sleep if you need to uh, um, again thanks for joining us from australia no worries mate this has been a pleasure all right that's all the time we have for today's episode don't forget to like the video subscribe to the channel add any thoughts you have below join us every week for new episodes of today in tech i'm keith shaw thanks for watching